Okay, good morning. Thank you for coming to this summer school, the IEEE uh, com 
computer intelligence summer school in computational intelligence and applications. This is a, a, an event uh, joint with the Latin American Conference on Computational Intelligence. And we have a, a, a number of very distinguished invited speakers. In this morning, we will have talks by Gerardo Rubino, Rosangela Balini, and Leslie Perez. And in the afternoon, by Marcelo Fiori, Gabriela Ochoa, and Federico Larroca. This school is uh, organized jointly by the Facultad de Ingeniería, Universidad de la República, by the uh, IEEE, and by the ICT4V, see the, the International Center for uh, in Technologies in, in Uruguay, which is a, a center for developing joint projects between uh, academy, industry, and government. Now we will introduce, <coughs> sorry, our first speaker, Gerardo Rubino. Dr. Gerardo Rubino is a senior researcher at INRIA, the French National Institute for Research in Computer Science and Control. He created and managed two research teams at INRIA over a period of 30 years. The, the teams were called Armor and Dionysus, working on the analysis and design of complex systems, usually in telecommunications. He's been a board member of the Media Networks Cluster in France, in Brittany, France, for about 15 years. He has also been scientific delegate for the RENES unit of INRIA, a responsible research networking at Telecom Bretagne Engineering School, associated editor of uh, the um, international journal Naval Research Logistics, former uh, member of the steering board of the European Network of Excellence, EuroFGI, responsible of the relationships between network and European industry, he uh, has also been head of the International Partnership Office at INRIA RENS for five years. He is uh, now a member of the AFIP Working Group 7.3. He's interested in the quantitative analysis of complex systems using probabilistic models. He uh, works in performance and dependability analysis, perceptual quality assessment of audio and video applications and services, and on machine learning tools with applications uh, mainly networking. He's also, he's the author of the PSQA, the Pseudo Subjective Quality Assessment Technology for a Quality Real Time Evaluation. He also works in uh, methodologies for the analysis of rare events, for instance, on the evaluation of risks. So, uh, we welcome Gerardo. Okay, good morning, and thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, allowing me to participate in this school. I'm going to describe uh, this family of neural networks. Let me check. Oh. Uh, called it random neural networks. Then uh, give you an idea of some of the applications which are the same applications you find in standard neural networks. This is a rather exotic family of uh, tools coming from probability modeling. Um, okay, the, the first part I will, in the first part I will show all these slides that describe this model to give you an idea of the way it works. And then uh, perhaps some words about the origin of the model. Uh, the main application we have in our team using this, this uh, new networks and uh, another example of an extension to another area, always using the same idea. And in the slides, there are some references. So, okay, let's go. Um, consider classic artificial uh, neurons, classical neural networks, starting by classical neurons. And uh, um, 
And one way of describing this, this object is to, uh, to see it or to identify it to the activity function of the neuron. I, I assume you, you know the basics of these kind of things. So, uh, let's call a neuron a function like I don't know, okay, I don't need to point a function like, as for instance, that one, a real function of a real variable with a parameter typically, the bias, V here. Uh, I put some examples of the typical functions used in different neural networks, in different neural networks tools, like the really one here with a bias. Uh, like hyperbolic tangents, etc. And you build a network, as, I assume you know, by connecting these kind of boxes. And in the connection, you wait. When you, uh, look at the global, uh, let's say flow arriving to a specific neural, a neuron in the network, you uh, wait the signals arriving to the, to that neuron coming from different neurons using weights which are positive and negative trying to imitate the functioning of a, a real neuron where, as you know, the connections are of two types, uh, inhibiting or exciting the receiving neuron. In this model, once you uh, see neurons as activation functions and then some rules to combine them in a network, this is a, the equivalent view of a random neuron. I will explain why this random word in the definition. But now you have two ports, two, in, two um, input this thing, I'm not going to use it. I think I have another one. Yes. That doesn't work. Okay. So you have two input, we say ports. We call that, uh, the, that one receiving the signal U, uh, the positive port. The other one is the negative port. It's just terminology, but it corresponds to exciting or inhibiting the receiving neuron. And the output is a function of two variables now, with a parameter that we call the rate, that is the equivalent to the bias in the classic neuron. And the function is this simple rational function or a variation built around that. Okay? So this is a random neuron. The rate is strictly positive. So that this fraction, given the fact that U and V are positive signals, positive numbers, positive functions of time. See, yes. Let me, let me check again. No, it worked. At, uh, it, but it seems to go one step. But it, it doesn't matter. I have a third option here. But for that one, I cannot go too high in the screen. So the rate, the function is a function of two positive random variables. And it takes this form here, or a variation of that. The variations are described here. For instance, you can use this is that one. Um, no, back. And back again. Uh, 
and you have this uh, most it is the most used shape uh, or form of the function, the output function, the activation function of this neuron, where you take the minimum of this number and one, making that the output is okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, this one. Okay. Here, uh, you, what we are doing is to uh, force the output to be less than or equal to 1. And then we multiply by the rate r. So now the output is less than or equal to that number there. All this story comes from the origin of this model. I will say at least a few words about that. Um, in many applications, the rate is set to 1, so the output is this function now, with a 1 here. The inventor of this model is Errol Gelembe, that is not any, is a moving target, he's not anymore at Imperial College now, but if you go to the web, you will find a lot of papers around it, his model, and you will have a bunch of papers in the artificial intelligence area, say, in the learning, machine learning area, another set of papers in the stochastic process analysis area, and a third one in biology, biology journals, because this model uh, comes somehow also from the from the, from the humid neurons, and um, he applied and other people this model to analyze this kind of thing uh, also. We are here concerned by the learning one. Yes, the last comment I forgot to read is that, just in case, there is nothing random here, just the name, okay? So, um, it has memory somehow. This is, using this, it's better to have a look at this function here there to understand the dynamics of this thing. The output of the neuron as a function of the positive what is arriving at the positive port, take this form, is linear in U, everything being constant now, and when you arrive at U equal to uh, this number, uh, there's an, an error here, we try to, for, not for to modify, correct, this is B, D, and uh, in my notation, okay, this is R. Um, in at that case, the mean will make that this part, this factor, will be 1, and you output the constant R. Then you can look at the evolution of the output as a function of the rate of the, what we call the negative signal, but it's just um, the way you call it. It's a positive number. Then, when you increase V, you decrease the output in a hyperbolic way. This is in the denominator. And this is the shape when U, the, the signal arm at the positive port is less than the bias R. Okay, that's a uh, copy paste. With errors here. And this is the shape in the case where u is larger than the parameter. The important thing is to understand a little bit the dynamics. Let me go back to the picture here. u plays the role of a signal weighted by a positive weight in a classical model, and the u in v plays the role of a signal 
weighted by a negative weight in the classic and standard model. But now everything is positive. And then we must go to the to the process of building a network with the things and you will get pictures like this one. So you have only an output from coming out of any of the neurons and you send signals to the different ports of some neurons in the network, like the picture, and you have weight that usually we denote this way. For instance, this is the weight of the signal coming out of neuron 1 and going to neuron 2 to the positive port. And W12 minus is the weight of the signal from this signal here, from the, the output of the first neuron to the negative port of the other one. So somehow you are behaving similarly as in a classic model. Um, and the construction, it must be said somewhere, you multiply the value of the output by the weight before arriving to the destination. And next step must be the, the other, the other side fork and join. Looking at the, a neuron during, uh, looking at what a neuron receives from other neurons. Uh, what arrives here at this port will be the sum of what is coming from that one and this one in this example. So the combination is as in the standard model additive and the weight are as in the classic model. Uh, Multi, uh, multiplied by the, the outputs. So this is a neural network. There is a now something that you can add to the rules and we, in general, it's done with this model, which is a constraint on the weight coming uh, out of a neuron here, a neuron I. And uh, the, the constraint that can be can look strange at this step is that the sum over any other, other neuron J of the weight plus and minus going from I to J, the sum on all possible J's, must be the rate of neuron I, parameter of neuron I. To understand this, we must have a look at the uh, the origin of this model, but you can, you can ignore this restriction and uh, stop the definition of the model in previous slide. In general, this is what is done. In our main application of this tool, we ignore this. At some point in time, we look at what happened when this constraint is uh, left. Okay. Uh, Um, I don't know, I will not go, I have too many slides, more than what I need uh, for the, the size of the slot. So I will skip many of them, but I prefer to leave them here in case somebody wants to go more in deep on the description. But very quickly, uh, for those who remember perhaps a bit of queuing, queuing theory, the very elementary queuing theory. This is the typical picture of an MM1 queue. You have people arriving here and leaving from there. This is the server. And here are people waiting for access to the server. You spend some time, which is a random variable, service time, some time here, come using the, ser the service provided by this system. And the uh, people arriving here arrive according to some rules. Uh, mathematically, you say that the, the arrival process here is a Poisson process. And uh, you have some basic things like this claim here. If 
the arrival rate is strictly less than the service rate. This, this array, sorry, speeds. This is in one divided by a unit of time, seconds, if you are in computer communication networks, for instance, or milliseconds. But there can be days if you are looking at some other uh, type of uh, unit queuing here. So lambda and mu are the parameters of this model. They are rates, speeds. And if the rate here is strictly less than the rate, the speed of the server, then the, the model, the stochastic process, the evolution of the process, number of people in the queue at time t, in the system at time t, is stable. Basically, that means that nothing goes to infinity. The number of people here keep, stays bounded with probability one, if there are probability people here. And, uh, and for this model, you can, uh, compute very easily the distribution of the number of people in the system, which is this geometric distribution where rho is the ratio between the two rates. And if lambda is less than one, this row here is strictly less than, sorry, see lambda is less than mu, the rate, the ratio, uh, rho is less than one. And, uh, another thing that comes very immediately from the, the definition of this model is that the ratio is one minus the probability that the system is empty. And this pi notation here refers to the state of the queue after an infinity unit of time, at infinity. Or you say in equilibrium, or in steady state. Practically, in computer science, after a few minutes, or in communication networks. Okay, and if if lambda is greater than or equal to mu, then the system is not stable, but you can say different things. In particular, you can say that the probability that at infinity, the probability that at infinity, um, I don't remember where I went yeah, here. If lambda is more than or equal to mu, then the system is unstable. After an infinity unit of time, there are an infinity number of people waiting, which means that the server, after uh, some time, after an infinity number of uh, units of time, as I said here before, you have an infinity number of people, and the server is always busy sending customers units out at rate mu. Mathematically, you can even say that there, is, there exists some finite time after which the probability that the system is always busy is one. So you will have a system always busy, a queue saturated after a finite point in time. So you can say that the load of this Q, the ratio rho, will be, in all cases, the mean between this ratio and one. And what did Grembe did was to look at this Q, sorry, not that one. Let me go now to the next picture. Imagine now that you have a, a variation on the same melody. You have your server mu, the same. I didn't say in the MM1, this is a Poisson, the arrival process is Poisson, which means that the time between two consecutive arrivals is exponentially distributed with parameter lambda, and the service time is exponentially distributed with rate parameter mu, with mean 1 divided by mu. The entire arrival in the MM1 has the arrival time has a mean equal to 1 divided by lambda. So now, variation, we have two streams of units arriving. 
the positive ones and the negative ones. And the positive ones are, as before, a Poisson process with rate lambda plus. This process here is also Poisson with rate lambda minus. The process, the two processes are independent of each other and independent of the process of people leaving. There is independence between what happens at the, the entry of the system and at the, the output as in the MM1. But here, the customers arriving from, from this side are, I call them antimatter customers. When a, a customer arrives here, it kills itself and let's say the last one waiting here, if there is some, if there is any at that position. And if not, just disappears. That means that the negative customers, you cannot see them in the network. If you have a, an application, you will indicate perhaps that something arises with a small light, and at, at the same time it disappears, either killing somebody in the queue or just disappearing if there is no, nobody when it arrives. So you can never see negative customers in the system, you only see the, the effects of the arrival of a negative customer there. There is some interference between the two. So this is a new queue, a new queuing system that has applications for people uh, knowing a little bit how communication networks work. Uh, this can play, play, for instance, the role of an ACK in a TCP controlled communication. You send a packet, it's a positive thing, and the receiver sends an ACK. You, you keep the packet here, a copy of the packet actually, waiting for the ACK, because perhaps the packet has been lost somewhere in the network and you have, must send it again. And the ACK just arriving kills the copy. There is no need to keep the copy here because the ACK is telling you that the arrival was successful. Okay, um, if you make the picture of this Markovian model, you get this thing, if you remember what that, which is the same picture of the MM1. In the MM1 you have lambda here and you have mu instead of the sum. And the stability said that lambda must be strictly less than mu in the MM1 to have a stable Markov chain, an ergodic Markov chain. Here, you uh, replace lambda divided by mu by lambda, divide, lambda plus divided by mu plus lambda minus. And you see the structure of the neural, random neural thing. So the random neural thing is exactly this Q. Exactly. Mathematically, it's exactly the same thing. That is why the authors started by writing papers in the queuing community and papers in the machine learning community. The object is exactly the same. The equations are the same. So uh, I will skip now the, all these examples that follow. Forget them. Just a comment here. Um, for this, perhaps I have to know. Okay, I will stay here. When you, in this, if you think Q's is a probabilistic thing, and you can write, you will write things like this one. Um, I'm interested in the traffic that goes from I to J. The rate of I, the sender, is Ri, the R parameter of the I neuron in the language of learning, or the rate of the server in the I Q in the probabilistic language is exactly the same thing. In the queuing system, you will multiply by the probability of going from I to J as a positive customer. When you leave a queue in a network of queues, 
the Gelenbe's model says you have a probability of going to the to a given destination as a positive customer, or you can change your class and go there as a negative one. Okay? So it's the last thing I will mention about the, the origin of the model. When you go, you only observe positive customer, you take a picture of a model, a network of this kind of queues, and you will be, you will see positive customers waiting at the different nodes. Uh, when they make the dynamics of this, it is crucial to say it, allows you to change the class from positive to negative. It's the only possibility, but there is no negative thing living in the network, nowhere and never. When you go to I to J, you can change your class to a negative one. In that case, is the negative behavior which uh, matters. So you go to J, J, you kill somebody there, and you disappear. Okay, and that replace or is equivalent to the connection uh, going of, of the arriving of a negative signal in the classic model. So that's uh, and that is why. If you sum here on J, make the sum, this doesn't depend on J, so you put it outside, and the probability going for, for, from I to any other Q, either positively or negatively, must be equal to 1. You go somewhere, you add a, another station or another neuron 0, correspond to the outside of the network, and this sum now must be one. You go somewhere and you leave. If, if you put Ri inside, then you get, and you multiply by I, Ri, you, you get the constraint that appears in the definition of the learning thing. Okay? This picture here, okay, to tw twice. We must stop it and change the direction. This is a neural network, um, a feed-forward neural network. This is the input neuron. These are the input neurons, the hidden layer, and the output ones. In this class of models, just with one internal layer, three layers, If you replace, if you want to build a formula for the output in terms of what arrives at the input neurons, you get immediately this expression, where you will see here, for instance, look at this one. This ratio here is the lambda divided by mu thing. And uh, if you remember, that's 1 minus pi 0, which means by 1 plus by 2 plus by 3, etc. Which means probability that the, the server is busy. There is somebody there. At least one unit. So here in, in the language of queuing, queuing systems, this, this means probability that the QI is busy, there is somebody there, times the weight which is the rate of neuron i, the speed at which the server works, times the probability of going to h as a positive customer. And this ratio here will be the row of neuron h. And all this numerator is the arrival rate to the output neuron o. So when you build a network with this kind of neurons, the output seen as a function of the input x1, x2, x3, is a rational function. If you uh, eliminate all the internal fractions and you build a huge, horrible, final fraction, you will have a polynomial divided by a polynomial in the variables x1, x2, x3. The polynomial is many variables, and the degree will be perhaps very high. But it's a polynomial upstairs and another one downstairs. 
and polynomials are easy uh, objects to work with. So, for instance, for make integration, derivation. So these tools allow for a nice mathematical uh, manipulation in general, and that is why, I mean, is half of the reason why we sh chosen for our applications. So now I accelerate. Let's ignore this. Um, I will describe. Let me see all these details. So um, when you receive a video on the internet, it changes completely the, the story. Uh, one important task is to be able to quantify the quality of what you are seeing. This task is considered hard because this quantification is completely subjective for us. If you look at the, I don't know, the, the time you click somewhere in the screen and the web page arrives, the response time of that service is something you, you, the user, are very sensitive of. If it is too long, you will change the, your navigator, you will change something. Um, but to measure that is just the time, the response time of the system, that is, the arrival time of the, what you requested minus the time at which you requested the thing, the service, the information, the web page. That's very easy to define objectively. And in principle, there is no problem to measure that and to work with. It's just a delay. And we call it also the delay. But for the quality of uh, something on your screen, some video sequence here, the, any, uh, any of us see, have a personal view, and people will say that the quality of the, this movie is very good, or the copy you have, or the thing you receive by some streaming uh, platform, using some platform, um, that's subjective by definition. And there is no objective definition of that. Perhaps one day, but when we will know exactly what we have there, here, uh, but not today. So the application we built using machine learning long time ago was to build a tool able to provide as a quality something very close to the result of asking more or less 20 people, randomly chosen a sample of humans, asking them to evaluate the quality of many sequences. Only one is impossible. You must evaluate many ones for, uh, for defining your your own way of, for, for defining node, for capturing your way of evaluating quality, your personal way, and then you take the average using some numerical range. Um, in the previous slides, I discussed all these things, and uh, this is, this picture actually is only to tell you the following. We took this rabbit the sequence, uh, the rabbit is a central, I think is a central character of the, I call it the, the giant rabbit thing. And we added, and perhaps you see it here, in this rectangle here, we added noise. A perturbation, a strong one. So this is typically rejected as very, very low quality by the humans. And this one, is the same picture, of course, the same uh, frame in, uh, in the flow, but the same noise was, was added here. So we, you see that making the diff between the two, the original sequence, the original frame, the original picture, and the received one is not good to evaluate the quality as the basis of a quality evaluation. Okay? Because here, the difference is exactly the same. The same number of pixels are touched, 
in the same way. So if you take the difference, the matrix difference of the two pictures, you will get the same uh, matrix. And you, if you use some formula, like is done in, this is what we call the PNSR, the peak signal to noise ratio, the difference between the two images pixel by pixel, added here, and then the scale there by the size of the matrix. You get a number that is interesting and useful, but not for an approximation to the human perception of the quality of the thing. So we did an application that measures quality um, very accurately. And the idea is very simple, which is described in many slides following this, is you take a set of short sequences, uh, a few, not 1,000, uh, 10, sampled in the market you are interested in, if, uh, I don't know, if Netflix calls you, Netflix has their own tools, engineers. But um, imagine you are doing that for Netflix, so you take a sample of the huge Netflix database, different kind of sequences from different movies, and then you show them to humans, and humans will evaluate them, each of them. Humans means a panel of 20 people. But uh, you, for building those uh, sequences you will show to the humans in the panel, you will degrade them randomly by modifying important parameters of the thing connecting the source to the destination, which is a network, the internet, a part of it, and that other parameters related to the flow of pictures composing the video stream arriving at the destination. For instance, the bit rate, the, the speed of the connection, the losses in the network, if there are losses, and things like that. So you select those parameters and you build, that's hard in general, a platform where you can move them. You take a picture, the rabbit one, and you make 10 copies, each one and each, each of the copies is sent with a different loss rate in the network that you control, at least a different speed, a different bit rate, um, a different uh, protection against losses if there are some protection in the network, that's, there is always one, and so on. You select four, five, six, seven parameters important for quality, for the possible degradation at the destination, you move them randomly according to some complex rules, but the picture randomly, and then you show to the humans, the humans provide you a, a quality value, and then you perform a supervised learning task. And, and that task will ask a tool to build a random neural network that is a rational, a fit forward one in our tools, a fit forward random neural network, mathematically a rational function, polynomial divided by a polynomial, where the input are all those parameters you can control in the experiment. And uh, the output is the quality. And you try to behave as an average member of the panel. So that's the application we did with this thing. This means that uh, this is a tool for, you can do the same for voice. This is for voice, uh, node one. Each point here is just to show you what happens. Each point here is a sequence, a short sequence of video content. For, for instance, for IP telephony, a conversation. Each point is a sequence. Here is the quality of the sequence, that sequence uh, given by the humans in a panel. So I call that the truth. So for this sequence, the quality was 2.9. Uh, um, and here, 
for the same sequence, for instance, this one, this is the value given by some automatic tentative to evaluate quantitative inequality. And this cloud is saying that the value of this is very, very low. If the points were in this, uh, this line, which is the y equal, equal x line, if the scale here were the same, then you have something which is exactly, behaves exactly as the humans. But this is the real picture you get when you use some, uh, this was a commercial tool, some tool like as that one. This is for video and the same behavior. So our tool is called the PSQA. And let me show you, this is the description detailed uh, of how this works. For instance, and you get um, a way of, a, a tool sending out the quality of the sequences. Here is the output of PSQA of this tool. It's the name of the tool, pseudo subjective quality assessment. And this is the same output, I mean the same conditions, but given by the toolbox of MATLAB some time ago, not today perhaps is different. And this shows that the random neural network thing worked much better than MATLAB. That this is, this kind of thing is why we use it as exotic tool. So this is given by the polynomial function coming out of the feed forward neural network built with these neurons. This shows that in this case, for instance, uh, the Gelembe's tool worked much better than a classical machine learning tool. So it's an example of application of machine learning and um, using this network exactly as we use today, uh, I don't know, Keras, OpenAI, or whatever the tool you like to use. So we ignore this and then 32. Very quickly, is the last point in the talk. Another um, use of random neural networks that we did with, I will go directly to the thing. Uh, with another Uruguayan coming, uh, coming from this university, but working in Czech Republic today. Imagine uh, this is a neural network, the input of the network, the output neurons, the input neurons, and the connections. There is an area called, call it, call it, call it, reservoir computing. Tiene inercia. Esta es la, you must read it up twice. So, a network, Imagine a neural network, there is nothing to do with neural, random neural ne uh, networks, uh, random neurons, etc. The specificity of this reservoir computing area is the connections inside this, this set of neurons, the colors should be more or less different, green should be, I think. Yes, here, here is very clear, here is not. But you see the color is different. This is blue and this is green. All this is green. This is the reservoir. These are the input neurons. For example, for PSQA, we'll have typically five, six here. And for PSQA, we have one, only one here. And the main characteristic of the reservoir computing area is that this network, in this network, the weights inside this part of the network don't learn. You, def you initialize their values at the beginning and then they are frozen forever. The only part that learns is the, the set of weights of the connection going to the output. The rest is fixed. The reason of that is that for time series applications, imagine a time series, for instance, the price of sugar as a function of time, 
discrete time for instance every day, the temperature of some place, some place somewhere, uh, every day, a sequence of numbers. This type of network, forgetting about the rest of our computing, the type of network meaning that here, I don't see any, no one here, for instance, you have a circuit. You have a ne neuron sending to the, this one that sends to that one that sends to the initial of the cycle. Okay? You have uh, circuits in the graph there and that, that complicates a lot learning tasks, but that works very nicely for prediction the future of a time series. And the networking, so basically, if you have a neural network with circuits, it is powerful to make things with time series, for instance, predicting the future of something, forecasting, more precisely in English, and they are hard to learn, to, to perform the, a learning task. So, powerful for the application, but hard to train. This thing was invented because of that. In this thing, you have circuits. That's nice for prediction of the future of a time series. But for the learning process part, the only learning part is this one. And for this one, first of all, is feed forward. You go from left to the output. In general, that will be make something easy to train. And moreover, the this training structure can be and is in general a simple regression. That's very simple. Even a linear one. So it's easy to learn and has the nice property of circuits. And I will finish with this. So what we did twice. And then one more. We use it. Imagine I want to try to check what happens if I use random neural networks now. But this is, this has this kind of things. So I go to discrete time, one, two, three, four, and some time unit. And then I define, this is, a, this is a definition, let's write the dynamics of the thing this way for any neuron U in the middle of the network at time T at time 100, the output of the neuron will be given by this formula where you will see something for another neuron V at T minus 1, one second before, one unit of time before. And if you look from your position, you will recognize the structure of our of the activation function of a random neural network, random neural neuron, you have this kind of expression where you have again the ratios here and the weight, the ratios, the weight, plus the rate of the neuron we are looking at, and the rest of the notations correspond to the same thing that appears when somebody shows you a uh, a random neural network and explains the way the dynamics. So basically it's the same kind of dynamics except that the, we call this in this area the state of neuron U and the state of neuron U is a function of the input what arrives and the state of the neuron going to U one unit of time before in the past. That's a nice property of these kind of things. Present state depends, depends on the past. And the future depends on the past, because the future depends on the present, that depends on the past. This property allows you to, little by little in training, when you show a long sequence to the network, because of these circuits, and this T minus one, the thing memorizes starts to learn what happened in the past and to react to detect patterns in the series, which is the goal. So I don't time I don't have time to show you more about that, but this is another application, the same idea that works very well in specific applications. 
Okay. Let's stop. If you have any question. Are there any questions? No. This this uh, last work is is very interesting. Have you used in in which type of uh, time series? Uh, in in days, in years? Uh, how how many time steps? Ten, one hundred, one thousand. Um, we use it. We test this in 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 many examples. Um, that come from the main papers in the reservoir computing area in more general in time series prediction forecasting that appears in the lit literature and those concern uh, some things coming from uh, agriculture problems I don't remember financial things um, population evolution but they are in databases uh, very, the access is free and you can check your ideas for forecasting tasks coming there. Typically, and another class, interesting class of systems that I don't have time to explain is chaotic systems. If you, Lorentz, you know, the Correct. butterfly moving the wings somewhere in the it's planet and then a tropical storm the other day. In the opposite side of the earth. Those kind of things are very hard to predict because of this chaotic behavior. And that's a, a typical benchmark for this kind of thing. And the number of steps ahead can be 50, 60, but it doesn't, it, it depends on the scale. If you want to predict the price of something using milliseconds, you will go probably, you say the same as now in 1,000 units of time ahead. But in interesting, in, in a correct scaling, you, you obtain these kind of things. If the unit of time is the day, we are trying this kind of, this, not these ones, but other more standard tools for predicting the temperature. That was the, the goal of the workshop of yesterday. Yeah. And we failed today <laughs> to predict 30 days, 40 days is hard. But it thinks about the temperatures, high temperatures in the next summer, for instance, now. Next summer is for this place from December 1st to the end of February. Uh, we don't, it seems extremely hard to say something about the trend temperature, either just very, very general things. It will be hot the summer, or it will be more or less standard, or less than usual. Three classes. And that's very hard. I mean, not only for us, for people, for the 15 big centers providing that information today on the internet. Columbia University is one of the important ones. And all they can say is this kind of things. They, they know that next summer will be hot globally. But, uh, the error today for this kind of stuff is huge. But in other case, cases, Things, even this one we invented with Sebastian, are uh, working very well. Very well. Excellent. I do have one question myself. Yeah. Which is the results of the game? <laughs> <laughs> well, Argentina lost. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Two one one two. <laughs> it's more striking than this story. This is very striking. So <laughs> it, it would be very difficult to predict with this. <laughs> yeah. I think it's better to ask uh, the octopus, Paul. Yes, the full Paul <laughs> will be more powerful than that one. Uh, other questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thanks. Coming back, one for one, another one. Yes, 
I need uh, is uh, at this. Okay. Do you want to check uh, use, uh, yes. commands in the new screen? Yeah, here. Yes. The first. Yeah. And six. Smooth. We now present uh, Dr. Rosangela Bellini. She is an associate professor with the Department of Economic Theory, Institute of Economics, University of Campinas, since 2002. She is also a researcher at the Brazilian Institute of Data Science. She received the Bachelor of Science degree in Applied Mathematics from the Federal University of Sao Carlos, Sao Carlos, Brazil. The Master of Science degree in Mathematics and Computation Science from the University of Sao Paulo in Sao Carlos. And the PhD degree in Electrical Engineering from the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the University of Campinas in Brazil. Her research interests include machine learning, modeling and time series forecasting, decision making and applications. Welcome, Rosangela. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if I use all this, but uh, I try. <laughs> uh, well, uh, good, uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to stay here and uh, participate for this summer school and uh, the conference too. Uh, well, uh, I think it, it's appropriate this subject after the first one because uh, I will present a fuzzy inference system, uh, especially for forecasting. <laughs> uh, this is my, my uh, research area. And I, uh, I will present the fuzzy inference system, some theory and the application. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will present the uh, introduction first. Uh, when I show some concepts and the uh, motivation of studies, fuzzy inference systems. But uh, again, uh, I use the fuzzy inference system for forecasting, time, uh, time series forecasting, okay? And the, the fuzzy inference system has two parts. The first part we use the clustering algorithms, and the second part we need to determine the forecasting. Uh, then, uh, here I will present briefly. <laughs> The fuzzy C means and the participatory learning to cluster algorithm and I indicated the difference be, uh, between the, these learnings. And the, uh, finally, I, for each one, I will present the applications uh, first, string flow forecasting, and the second one is stock market forecast. Well, uh, before first sets, I needed to say something about classical theory, uh, because when I use classical theory, uh, uh, an object belongs or no belongs the uh, specific set, a specific uh, filter, okay? Uh, but uh, in many times, I don't have a, 
information or uh, precise information about the data and and to say if the uh, an object belongs to a set is complicated. Then first sets came, né, or theory of first sets came to motivation when I don't have uh, precise information about the data, like oh, uh, oh, like here. Okay, okay, <laughs> like here. Like here, the credit scores. Uh, I I have a, a here three sets, three levels: low, average, and high to classify the credit score. And the, uh, when I in, in this case, uh, the, given the credit, credit scores, uh, the information belongs one, just one level. For example, if the level is 3.5, we have 100% that this credit score belongs the high, okay? When we have a uh, first set, the interpretability is a uh, approximated way. Uh, the first set theory allows an object belong to mult multiply sets in the reasoning framework. And for each set, there's a degree to true or if the object belongs to a first set and the, how the membership degree he belongs with the uh, first set. Mm -hmm. Like here, in this example, we have it three uh, the same three levels, but we don't, we have the membership functions to represent the each, uh, level. For example, the low, high, uh, average, and high. And in this case, for the same score, credit scores, 3.5, this credit score belongs the high uh, high membership and the average membership function. For each one, the first is 0 0.6 degree for high membership function and 0 0.2 the average function, okay? And uh, we need here to try this situation because it's not precise when I say uh, the, the credit score is high or average. I, I, I'm sure that the 3.5 is not uh, low uh, mem belongs the membership function, but uh, I don't have uh, some information about the other as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, the future of, uh, but uh, we have uh, some questions here. How uh, the membership functions are defined? When I define the, f the mathematics form and the parameters that define the, the membership functions, I here. 
Uh, here I use the, the membership uh, trapezoidal membership, and we needed to define the modal values and the dispersion values for this. Uh, many times when I have an expertise about the credit scores, for example, uh, the person could give the information about or uh, the average score I classify. I, I don't have a uh, the if the credit score is 1.5 to uh, 2.2, but when is about 0 0.5 to 4, there are, uh, the credit score belongs the average, but they uh, have more information about high infer uh, or low credit card. Uh, then we need to define the membership functions and the, uh, the membership functions define the first sets. And the usually use the simple functions like uh, triangle, trapezoid, or Gaussian functions is more usual. But uh, in this case, we need to define the parameters. And we need to put the form that the membership function I will take. Uh, well, here, I will be, uh, I'm going to build the model using a uh, measure or observate data. Uh, this is, that is, uh, I don't consider the uh, expertise about uh, my, to define the membership function, the parameters of the membership function. Uh, uh, the data uh, are used to define these parameters, okay? And the, the models require to characterize the relation to a system under consider between variables, variables input and output variables, okay? Which may be grouped into input and output variables. Specifically, I use the input variables to classify using algorithm, clustering algorithm, and the output is my forecast, okay? And uh, I need uh, these information for constructing, construction this model. Uh, traditional approaches are well theoretically developed and practiced practically in linear cases, but in many cases, I don't have a linear relationship between the variables. We need uh, neural networks like the, my colleague present, presented to you, or fuzzy techniques. Here, I try fuzzy modeling, okay? I show fuzzy modeling. And, yeah. oh. A fuzzy model is uh, assumed, of course, I can to, to show the information about the linguistic rule. Here I don't have uh, this uh, point because uh, my goal is forecasting, not uh, interpretability of the model. It's not my, but the first model has interpretability. Uh, I constructed the model using measure numerical data. And the goal of the 
model building establishes a early base. Or if I have some conditions, then I have uh, the output. Okay. Uh, the first uh, model proposed the, at the theater was in was introduced by Tong in 1980 uh, using measured data, and in 1985 Takaks again introduced the first model a local relation. I used this. Uh, proposed the inspired the Takatsugen model. Okay, we are concerned with the problem with mo uh, of modeling uh, by a, a rule based model. <laughs> uh, here uh, I started to show the idea of a rule based model. And I have it, uh, a set with input and output. And uh, we have uh, M inputs. And uh, I have uh, just one output. And uh, the fuzzy rule is. Uh, is basically like this. If we have some conditions or antecedents, then we have the consequence. Uh, each uh, input is represented by a membership function or a first set, like here. A one i and the x m key is a m i and the, I needed to combine the or uh, this information uh, to compute the output of the this our uh, rule. Uh, Takaks again proposed that the output of this rule is a functional relation. But here I show two forms, functional and relational models. First, né? The models are developed in two phases. The first phase, clustering algorithm, is applied to obtain a set of cluster composed by the data, fuzzy means. Fuzzy means is a supervised learning, and participatory learning is a unsupervised learning. Fuzzy means was proposed by Bezdeck, and the participatory learning proposed by Jaeger, okay? Uh, that data are classified according to the group structure or according to the uh, first, the, the clustering algorithm and the consequence of the rule are determined by relational or functional models. Here I have a, a, a schedule. Uh, we need, uh, we have a the data set. We needed to construct the patterns. Or we have a data set. We needed to construct the, what, uh, which the inputs and the output to determine the, the, the forecasting or for forecasting. And, after the construct patterns, we use these patterns to in the input for fuzzy clustering, and the consequence use the relational models or functional models. Uh, relational models is basically a pattern recognition, 
and uh, the functional modules based the regression models. Here, construction of the patterns. We can use, uh, for example, uh, the previous values of the of yt to uh, op the goal is uh, preview to preview the yt and or I can oh, I can use the the difference first difference of the pattern of the data and the, the data in level and the again the last one here is our uh, ob objective uh, clustering algorithm uh, fuzzy semis uh, given the pattern, and here we need to define the number of clusters, uh, and the, about after the number of clusters, we need to define the prototypes. What is the prototypes? Is the center of the clusters. The center of the clusters are determined like here is uh, U. ITM is the membership function, P is the pattern, and the, the membership function are defined by here, and we have the Euclidean norm, and the M is the parameter that I needed to define, uh, and the this parameter calls fuzziness of the partition. And the goal of the fuzzy semis is to minimize the, this function. And this function depends on the membership function and the distance between the pattern and the center. Or the, uh, given the number of centers C and uh, compute the membership function for each input or for each pattern at the cluster, uh, at the member, uh, membership function, I computed the degree and I computed the the distance between the patterns. Like here, we have uh, a pattern constructed two data, uh, L equal one. We need the last one and the uh, y t minus one and y t. Uh, we define four clusters, and uh, I have uh, four groups, and uh, here we have the centers or prototypes for each clusters. Okay, when a pattern, a new pattern arrives, the this pattern uh, is we compute the distance between the center and the pattern, and I computed the membership degree of this pattern with each cluster. Then, and this, <laughs> after the clusters are constructed, we need to determine the second phase. The second phase uh, is the computed the predictive value or forecasting value. In this case, again, we use the relational model first and functional model. Uh, here, I 
first I present the relational model. The, uh, the patterns, some patterns were presented and I constructed the, the clustering. And now I use this cluster for forecasting. Then I have data patterns SG and I need to preview the other patterns, okay? And I constructed, I divided my data set in two uh, parts. The second one is used to predict. And I computed the similarity between the, the prediction patterns and the pattern is that I constructed the model. And I, I use this similarity to construct the forecast. Like here, I replace the last component of the pattern using the, the most similar uh, date or the median or the average of the similar data and uh, I compute this pattern, uh, the membership pattern uh, using the structure that I constructed before and uh, I have the membership degree and finally I computed the forecast using the center and that the each rule and the membership function computed that this pattern. This is the first one. It's a uh, really uh, in general is not uh, is it's not. A, complicated in this case because it, 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 it's a similar a random walk model. Oh, if it, I look at that, uh, I, I suppose the, the forecast is the same that I have before because it, I, I don't have uh, more information. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the second one, no. I use a functional model, linear model, okay, regression model. And uh, the functional model for time series for care uses FCM again to group date pattern and de develops a local model for each group. And uh, what is the local model? Uh, we need the, for each local model, I, I go right here. Okay. For each group, I use these data for adjust a local model using regression model for each group. And the forecast is a combined the all local models uh, and the information about the membership function for the patterns in each group. And again, we have the pattern. We apply the first semins with this pattern. And I compute the functional or regression model for each uh, group. And the the output, uh, in this case, is computed the membership function uh, and weights the local model for each group. Because it, uh, I have the sum 1 and n. For each group, I computed the membership degree for specific pattern and 
I computed the output of the local model. The forecast is a combination or aggregation about the membership function and the local model. Here, uh, I show the first uh, application of this idea. Uh, I used string flow in Brazil. Uh, the energy is based on hydroelectric plant. 80% of the all the energy in, in our country is from a hydroelectric power plants. This is really important for planning and control of the water and the energy systems. And well, here I show I used the the data for clustering of the cluster cluster the patterns and cluster I used the data in this interval. And the, the validation data I used uh, the last uh, 80 years. Uh, the string flow uh, for a uh, series is seasonality, uh, has a seasonality pattern, and we need uh, in the sector use 12 modules for each month. And you use the same here for, uh, or, uh, we, we don't remove the seasonality. We try, uh, using for our speci uh, specific model for each month. Uh, in Brazil, you use the periodic autoregressive model here. Uh, and uh, we compared the, the results of this proposed, the, also the neurofuzzy network proposed by Figueiredo and Gomid. Uh, the data I, uh, are average monthly string flow time series, uh, located in northeast of Brazil. The name of the hydroelectric plant is Sobradinho. Uh, to determine the inputs and the number of clusters, uh, we use this measure, uh, or we determine the number of inputs and the number of clusters where the MAP is minimal. <laughs> uh, the, uh, for example, here I use the string flow values to September, uh, to forecast the September month. Uh, the, for functional models, use three uh, legs to determine the, the forecast for septem September. And the number of cluster is equal eight. Here, uh, for classification, you construct the pattern using here uh, the difference, the first difference be between, because it, September is a month, the uh, uh, transition period between dry and wet seasons in Brazil. And uh, I use, it in, uh, specifically in September, I use the first defense and the two legs, a August and a July, to preview September. And uh, I constructed the patterns to uh, determine the the, f uh, the structure of the clustering and to preview the last uh, 
one, uh, but the pattern is are construct the same form. Uh, when I use the recognition, uh, the the similarity of the patterns, I use the the membership degree of the the pattern. This pattern for O for oh no <laughs> here 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 this pattern for each group and determine the more similarity and uh, we computed the using uh, the membership degree and the center and the other one I use the modal uh, the functional model. The procedure there is repeated to, for each month from January to December. And here we have the forecast, uh, one step ahead <laughs> forecast just here. Okay. The, the, here the relational partner. Of course, the difficulty is preview the wet <laughs> and not the okay. Uh, this this period is more difficult. Uh, we have the variability, but uh, in this period the models are good. We don't have problem when I have the dry period. And uh, here we have the functional models. Well, of course, we look here at uh, the, the first one model was better when I look at just the figure. And uh, when I look at the, the performance compared to the root mean square error, uh, mean av uh, absolute error, uh, percentual error, correlation between the forecast and the, the observed data, and here the variability of the forecast. And the, we look the two proposed here. We, we have, uh, but, oh, Similar performance, uh, but the multi-layer perception is not a, a good model in this case. The periodic autoregressive model, we have 20% of the uh, error. And uh, when we use the functional models, when I compare the percentual error, we have the more, uh, the better performance. But uh, the performance are similar that uh, the other. Now, uh, when I use this model, we have uh, some, uh, uh, definition. We needed to define the number of inputs and we needed to define the number of clusters. Uh, the performance is related to for uh, clustering model. Then, the more recently, we use the participatory learning algorithm. The participatory learning algorithm we need to define the number of centers. Of course, we need to define the number of inputs, uh, but uh, the number of the center, no. The concept of participatory learning was introduced by Jaeger, and the uh, evolving, the idea of evolving, what is the idea of evolving? I, evolving is the adaptive systems, okay? Uh, for each input, the system, uh, the structure of the system modified 
and uh, the parameters are updated and a new uh, structure we can have. Uh, uh, Angelov, in 2002, proposed the evolving food systems, and uh, Silva, in 2005, used the participatory learning in fuzzy clustering, and 2005 to uh, Lima proposed the, the evolving participatory learning. The idea is uh, we have, again, uh, the, the ruling base, and uh, here we have the uh, linear model, and the linear model is based on the, the inputs, of course, and the, we need to determine the, the parameters out. Uh, for each input, we need to define the membership f uh, function. Here, use Gaussian membership function, and the uh, we computed the activation of this rule using the product of the membership functions. And the, the output of the model is weighted average of the individual local models, like here. Okay? Depends on the membership functions and the output of the local model. Well, evolving participatory learning, I need the, uh, cl the clustering is uh, performed at each step. We need, we can some uh, possibility. A new cluster can be created or other cluster can be modified and redundant cluster are eliminated. And uh, this is the structure uh, change all the time. Depends on the performance, it depends on the input, if it is uh, belong or not of the cluster, the structure the cluster. Oh. Uh, each cluster center defines the focal point of a rule. Parameters of the consequent uh, functions are uh, determined using recursive least square algorithm and uh, EPL use a full similarity measure to find the proximity between new data and the existing cluster center. Like here, I have the pattern composed of the P uh, informations or observations. Uh, v is the pro prototype or the center of the cluster, and the goal of the participatory learning is determine the center for and update the, the data for each data uh, arrive. In other words, X key is used as a vehicle to learn about the, the centers are updated like here. And the, the, the pattern, this center or prototype need to define this learning rate. And the why, why is the a uh, distance between the uh, inputs and the centers. And uh, we needed to compute the 
arousal index. And the, the arousal index is uh, determined using this form. Uh, and here we have a small algorithm. Uh, for each input, we computed the arousal index. If the arousal index is higher than a parameter tau, we created a new cluster. This new cluster, the center is uh, the input, and the, the output is computed. In the, uh, if the R also is not higher than tau, we updated the center and the arousal index. And if the distance between this cluster, uh, if the clusters are, are higher than lambda, uh, the rule are excluded. And after this first part, the last part, I computed the consequence of the rule. Here, I compared the performance using stock market returns, uh, and I compared the performance using another uh, evolving models proposed by Angelov. Uh, use two uh, sets, SP500 and the Ibo Vespa. Uh, during this period, we use the uh, first one third of uh, total data, and the input selection I determine using oh, autocorrelation function, uh, and the, I for computed the S. P, the forecasting for SP 400 use five legs and the Ibovis but three legs. And I compared the performance using auto regressive integrated moving average. Here, uh, the pattern need to define in these algorithms. And the performance of the algorithm is determined using the root mean square error and mean absolute error. Here we have the performance of the evolving models when I compare the using the uh, other models. These models, the evolving models have the better performance than a linear model, and the performance is similar than auto uh, artificial neural network. And here we have the my time is finished. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here we have the Ibo Vespa index, and the performance is similar. And the conclusion, uh, evolving, I think the, when I have the model using the idea of evolving, first modeling is better than when I have a time series that have a great, uh, variability. Because the, uh, this model are updated the structure then I think this is better than linear model. Uh, and the, the evolving models high, present high performance because it, they cap capture marked movements. Uh, the performance are better than ARIMA and the neural networks. And uh, I think this is 
the pharmacy is better. And here we have the references. And now, thanks. Are there any questions? Uh, I was wondering about uh, the how complex are the the final rules of of, of your systems, um, because I I am wondering about uh, um, the the there's a, no like a new trend about explainable artificial intelligence, and when you are dealing with um, with sub problems, uh, for instance, we work with chemical engineers that operate plant or something and they don't trust in a neural network. They mm -hmm. need something to watch, to see and try to understand like uh, uh, the rules. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was wondering how complex the, the, the final rules that yours, uh, your, your proposal obtains for this kind of time series are. Uh, I speak more the last model evolving, okay? Because uh, I think it's more uh, less complex than the other one. <laughs> because the the model, uh, when I, uh, the structure change all the time, uh, the number of uh, rules in, in this system is three or four for rules all the time and the interpretability is easy to do in this case and uh, I think this is better than the other one because the number of rules are fixed and uh, the performance Depends on the number of rules because they are fixed and is more complex and difficult to interpretability. Or I think the evolving is better than and less complex than the other one because the size of the model is little. <laughs> I don't have m much parameters to determine or to fix it in this model. It's a simple. But do you think that those models can be read by a human and, and like try to interpret what's going on? Uh, no, I, I, I never interpret <laughs> my models. I, I, I just have one paper that I interpretability the, this model, just one, because I use it in the application of uh, central bank, the interest rate and the, the, the exchange rate and the inflation, I need, in this case, specifically, the interpretability. Here, I, I, I just interesting by forecasting and the, the interpretability for, in this case, it's not necessary for me, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? I have a, a non-technical question. Usually, in, in your experience in, in Brazil, are there um, many companies interested in, in these models or is it still more uh, a theoretical research? How, how, it's not always easy to, to co conquest the, the, the companies to, to employ or maybe they don't tell them. Yeah. Uh, difficult. <laughs> it's difficult to know. <laughs> yes. But PhD yes. students, for example, they do work in industry. You know, they apply this. 
Yes, uh, uh, I think uh, in financial time series is more uh, the start to use it, these models, uh, but in industry no, in Brazil no. Of course, in Japan, yes. Of course, yes. In our countries, it's very <laughs> yes, <different. laughs> yes. But in Brazil, you no. Know, uh, now they start to apply this model in financial, the bank, machine learning. Uh, nowadays, the the financial markets are really interesting. In this case, and okay, thank <laughs> you. Thanks. Any other question? Sorry? No? Well, thank you again. <laughs> now we have a coffee break until uh, 11 a.m.
Welcome back. Um, the next talk is about uh, algorithm. It's, uh, it's titled "Algorithm Configuration Survival Guide," and it's going to be uh, done by Leslie Perez Cáceres. Leslie Perez is an associated professor at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso. Uh, Chile since uh, 2018. She's also the director of the Artificial Intelligence Diploma of the of, the, of that university, uh, Escuela de Ingeniería Informática. She received his master's degree in engineering science in 2011 from the Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria and her PhD in engineering and technology science from University Libre de Bruselas in 2017. Her main line of research are the automatic configuration of optimization algorithms and she's one of the developers of the eRace configuration tools. So, welcome Leslie. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, hi everybody also who might be joining us online. Uh, my name is Leslie, as uh, uh, I was well introduced. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, algorithm configuration, and I hope it's something that you have already experienced. And if not, probably it's going to be something that you will experience <laughs> uh, probably soon. Um, so, well, we're going to start directly. So, the first thing we are going to talk about is actually the problem of algorithm configuration. So we can formalize this problem uh, and define exactly what we are looking for when we are configuring an algorithm. Uh, and the first thing we need to uh, talk about is optimization algorithms, but in general this could be also extrapolated to any kind of uh, software, we could say, right? Um, so when these programs are used, we want them to have uh, good results, right? To get uh, efficient, uh, efficiency out of them, right? Uh, and this is not easy to, to achieve, actually. Normally these, uh, these programs, they will exhibit different parameters we need to tune. Right? Uh, so this is difficult and many of you maybe are students and you will know because when you are trying to develop this technique uh, you are always wondering like this uh, little drawing, right? Uh, whether if it works uh, or not and when it's not working, why it's not working and then when it works, why it works, right? This is all basically our, our, our task normally as research. So optimization algorithms in general are a collection of different components we can see them as a, as a collection of components. 
And when we are designing uh, this kind of tools, we are normally uh, focused on selecting these, uh, these components out of uh, a set of components that normally are available in literature, and then some others that we might uh, invent ourselves, right? And when we are trying to put them together, we are always trying to select them and actually tune them to have certain behaviors and also to uh, define their interaction, right? This is, this is what we normally do when we are defining algorithms. Parameters are actually design choices we made, uh, we, we should be making during the design, but we postpone them to the execution, right? This is uh, something that we can see even in machines, right? Um, so normally are things that we need to decide uh, later, right? And there are many reasons why somebody could leave a, de a, a decision for later, right? In general, what we are looking for is to generate techniques algorithms that are flexible, that allow us to tackle different problems, right? And to do so, we need to have different components available. And this is why we have frameworks, for example, like CPLEX, that has a lot of parameters, uh, and it's not because uh, developers of CPLEX are really evil, right? It's just that there are a lot of parameters because we have a lot of components within this uh, framework, right? And we can select uh, these components uh, depending on what we are trying to do, right? So we want to have flexible algorithms uh, and also uh, getting the best performance in different cases, right? We know that performance is strongly dependent, especially in metaheuristics, if you are in that field. We know that uh, performance is actually very dependent on parameter sets, right? So this is kind of what um, what normally we would see when we are tuning parameters, especially when we have frameworks that are large. Right? Sometimes it's a bit overwhelming task, uh, especially when we are dealing with uh, something that is already uh, built, right? Like uh, some framework or some other code that you might inherit from another student or from your supervisor or whatever, right? So you have to decide where to put all these values. And sometimes we don't have a lot of intuition of what uh, we should be doing. Some of them might be interacting with another, right? Some of them might, might be active or not. So it's, it's sometimes a difficult task, right? In general, uh, you need a lot of um, experience with the algorithm and also with the problem you're solving, right? So what is the algorithm configuration task now that we define, right, all these things that happen when we are uh, uh, using algorithms or designing algorithms? Is the task of finding parameter settings, right, of an algorithm, so the values of the parameters, that exhibit best empirical performance. This is very important, the so best empirical performance. I will explain why. On a given distribution of problem interest. So what, what do I mean with this? And this is the formalization of the problem. We are trying to find a configuration, but this configuration that we are looking for is tied to a budget. So normally when we uh, run an algorithm, or when we try to execute a program, right, we have uh, execution conditions. And this, for a, an optimization algorithm, will be time, number of evaluations, etc. Yeah, there, there could be different limits that we uh, uh, impose to this uh, execution. And then we are trying to find this configuration that has actually the best uh, performance in terms of a configuration objective that is measured, right, on a set of problem instances, we assume that it's a distribution of problem instances, yeah, because we are trying to configure our algorithm to instances that we have not seen yet. If, if we have an algorithm for industry, for example, and, and I want to uh, schedule my uh, production line, right, I want this algorithm to work in, uh, environment, in, in the environment that I know, right, but in situations that I'm, I'm not yet aware of, right. So that's why we have this uh, space of, uh, of input. And then this configuration objective is actually a performance measure that is an aggregation of the performance of this configuration, right, on the set of instances, subjected to a termination criteria, right? This is the budget that we have normally defined for the algorithm, right? This aggregation could be different things depending on what you are looking for, right? Normally the mean, so we want to have some algorithm that performs well on average, right? But it could be something else, right? So why I say it was important 
uh, that we're talking about, you know, this uh, estimation of performance. Why would we, we have to estimate performance? This, this makes it a bit different, the problem of uh, algorithm computation, to what we normally know as an optimization problem, right? We have different sorts of variability in the assessment of performance, and the ones that we see directly here in our performance evaluation, right, are the parameter values. So when we change parameter values, performance changes, right? Then the resources. So when we change the resources, also performance changes, right? Um, and then the instance. Right? Each instance might be different, right? And then uh, when when probably uh, I don't know what what's going to talk about exactly Gabriela, but Gabriela knows uh, a lot about how landscapes change, right? Uh, depending on it. And then we have also other things, right? What we're trying to measure or evaluate is a stochastic in most, most of the time, especially for metallistics, right? So you measure once, and then you have one performance, and you measure twice, you have another performance, so you, we have some kind of distribution, right? Um, depending on the algorithm, this effect might be stronger or not, right? Uh, up to the point that some algorithms are determined, right? Uh, and then, this is very important, right? Uh, and, and probably in the keynote, I will, I will show some experiments because here we don't have enough time. Uh, platform also um, affects the results of uh, different algorithms, right? So this is something that we normally do not take into account. So uh, but then it might have a strong effect, especially when we are trying to configure to optimize time, execution time. Okay, so we are going to focus now on on this side of configuration, right, that is the offline tuning side, right? This is when we take our algorithm and we try to find good parameters before the execution. There is a whole different word when we talk about online tuning or parameter control, this is also another word that is used, that uh, actually takes care of this problem, but during the execution. So we are changing parameters, reacting to what is happening during the search, right? Uh, on offline tuning, we are trying to actually find a good uh, setting for the parameters that remains static in general during the execution, right? unless the algorithm has some, uh, some mechanism inside. So how we approach this offline tuning that, that was there, right, normally? Probably you already have uh, experienced this, right? So manual configuration. And this is when we try things. Normally you see, you see this reflected in lines in papers where they say, like, we made a preliminary experiment for setting these parameters, which are uh, the very strange things that uh, are, it's very secret because it's not normally reported in the papers, right? And we we assume that it's there, right? There, there, was, there was some experiment. And this is normally manual configuration. There are different types of degrees of how systematic can, can be made the manual configuration. And um, there is pros and cons uh, contrast to, to, this, um, to this process, right? The good thing about manual configuration is that is an excellent exercise for you to get to know the technique that you're using, right? So if you test many times and you start realizing, oh, this value of the parameter A, for example, always gives me like a really not great result, right? But if I combine it with another value, right, it works well. So this is the thing that you start figuring out and start taking you somehow an expert. So from the point of view of getting to know an algorithm, this is great, right? It's a good exercise. Um, and uh, it's also a good approach when we don't have a lot of resources, especially computational resources, uh, because uh, then we can do like very specific things, only target to what we are expecting to, to understand, right? The bad thing is that it's really um, tedious, right? It's not a, a nice, uh, especially if you have a lot of parameters, then testing all of them and try to understand what what's happening, it's actually boring, right? It takes a lot of time. Uh, it also takes a lot of computational resources that it, they are linked to the time of a person, which means that you have to be there testing things and then understand this, you know, what is happening. Uh, so in the end, this does not promote, uh, promote uh, flexibility. What happens is if you have to tune manually a new parameter because you added a new component that you might think is interesting, but you're not really sure, Sometimes, just to avoid all this pain of tuning, people do not add these strange wild components they could be trying to create, right? Um, and so, what I, I what I would argue is that sometimes uh, this, this 
type of manual configuration is on the way of uh, the creativity that we need to create this method for solving problems, right? So automatic algorithm configuration, what aims is at finding a, a high performance, uh, high performing parameter settings, uh, but automatically with techniques that are designed actually for doing this job, right? We design these configurators that are uh, trying to use the computational resources uh, in a um, efficient way. So we can remove this task so that it's a bit boring, right? And also a bit systematic, so it does not need to have a human uh, uh, expert all the time there, uh, from the hands of people that should be creating new methods instead. So this is what I, what I think, right? So let's, let's move into configurators then now, and I will introduce you a little bit about IRES, which is the method that I'm, I, I work with other people, between them, Manuel López Ibañez and Thomas Kutzler, and a whole lot of people that always are contributing to the, to the configurator. And this is what, what, what we are going to see. This is valid mostly for all configurators that you could find. Ah. Okay. That's, that's, okay. Okay. So this is valid for, for most of the configurators that you can find uh, in, in the literature. We are, Iris is not the only one, right? Um, so the first thing, right, is that we have here in the center the configurator. And this is kind of like, we will treat it now like a black box. And here we will uh, provide a setup. There is a parameter space, right, the configuration budget. So how much time we are willing to spend uh, searching for configurations, instances, and some settings that it might be required, right? And then this black box will execute our algorithm. This is our algorithm, right? And we will return with our algorithm some performance measure, and after a while, this black box will come back with a good configuration that we can use for uh, executing an algorithm. So this is how it works. So let's talk about the instances. Uh, and this is a bit more on the advice side on, of what you should do when we do automatic configuration. Instances must be always representative uh, for, uh, of, the, of the instances that we'll encounter when the algorithm goes into production, if you want to say, right? When we will apply it to solve a problem, right? And here we're going closer to what happens in machine learning, right? In machine learning, we, def we divide in training, testing, uh, validation, normally in between, right? Uh, so this is exactly what we do in configuration. So we define a set of instances that is the training set, Right? This is the instances that are going to be used to find this good configuration. And then we have a test set. And this will allow us to evaluate how good uh, is actually the configuration that we found. And also assess somehow if we are uh, overtuning to these training instances. Right? So it's important uh, to, to define very well these sets so are representative to, of what we will in the end uh, encounter when we execute the algorithm and also uh, to make them both, uh, between them, a representative of themselves, right? So let's talk now about performance measure and what we normally try to uh, obtain out of configuration. So we want to get normally uh, algorithms that are um, optimized somehow uh, regarding quality, so getting good solutions, right? Normally, uh, the solution quality directly, or maybe the gap to uh, some optimal solution that we know, etc. Uh, or we have sometimes uh, some configuration that has an objective that is uh, actually resource-based. Most commonly, you know, time. So we want in industry it's very normal, right? We want uh, algorithms that want that, that should be executed in a short amount of time, or at, at, at let's say an interval of time that we define. Right, so time to optima, time to a solution that is uh, close to what we know it could be uh, an upper bound or a lower bound, etc. Right, um, and then the performance measure can always uh, also add a penalization. Right, it can be penalized uh, when we see that some solutions might not be uh, maybe fulfilling some uh, constraints, right, or uh, uh, it's not uh, getting the right, um, let's say, behavior. Right. For example, if I have an algorithm, right, uh, that is using a lot of memory, I could penalize a solution that is very quick, right, but maybe it's using a lot of memory, for example. Right. These are different things that we could uh, imagine when we are trying to find algorithms. Let's just talk now about the parameter space, and this is probably one of the most critical things. 
uh, because when we are defining the parameter space, we are defining basically the variables that uh, or problem of algorithm configuration defines, right? So this, the parameter space should be uh, well thought, right? It's not that difficult, just you 